Well, glad to be with you guys today. I want to give you a welcome in, those of you joining from maybe one of our locations or online. Really glad you're with us. Hope you're having a great summer. Somebody once said, ah, summertime. That type of year, it's a time where parents pack up all the kids and they send them off to summer camp. That's a great time of year. Well, we've been going through a series called Summer in the Psalms. So instead of taking a summer vacation from God, we've been taking a summer vacation with God. So each weekend, we've been in the Psalms, right? In the heart of the Bible, there's a collection of 150 prayerful songs to help us connect with God in any situation. Each week, we've looked at a psalm. Each week, we have had a, a situation that we've looked at and taken a spiritual practice out of that psalm that we can carry into our everyday lives and our family and our relationships. So today, we're going to be talking about connecting with God when I feel depressed. Connecting with God when I feel depressed. So if you have a Bible, turn to Psalm 42. Psalm 42. If you don't have a Bible, maybe just, you know, smartphone, you can go to, you know, BibleGateway.com. You can punch in Psalm 42. See, or I would encourage you to download the Bible app called YouVersion. Go to your app store, type in YouVersion, download it, do a quick setup. And in there, you'll find Hill Country Bible Church. Every time we do an event, you can see our notes in there. So that's a good way too. So anyway, turn to Psalm 42. Now, by show of hands, how many of you like, you love, you enjoy listening to music? Hands, hands, some of you. I'm just fascinated by how music has the capacity to actually shape the way that we feel. It's like you listen to music, it can powerfully shape the way you feel. And in the world of music, there's there's an entire genre dedicated to one particular emotion, sadness course, we're talking about the blues. The blues. Maybe you're familiar with the blues great Albert King who wrote these words. Born under a bad sign, been down since I began to crawl. If it wasn't for bad luck, I would have no luck at all. Some of you are like, you're playing my song. That's my song. Another blues great, how about Lee Hazelwood wrote these words. He said, I've been down so long, looks like up to me. Now, can you just imagine for a moment, just imagine, if you listen to blues music all day long, every day, nonstop, how do you think you'd feel? I don't know, blue? Maybe kind of sad? Wouldn't be long, you wouldn't be able to tell if you had the blues or if the blues had you. In fact, you probably would begin to relate with this poor creature right here. Just take a moment, look it over, let the photo settle in. He gets this beautiful horse tied to a plastic chair. Here's a little news flash. I don't know if you know, but this horse has the capacity to pull like thousands of pounds. And here it is tied to a little plastic chair. Here's the magic question. Here it is. What's holding the horse back? Uh, I don't know, plastic chair, little three pound chair. I don't think so. I think the wind could blow that chair over. What's holding that horse back is a script playing in that horse's head. That probably sounds like this. You know you're stuck here. Actually, more like this. You know you're stuck here. (laughs) There's nothing you can do. You can't leave. That's, That's probably what's playing in this horse's head here. Here's this beautiful creature with amazing capacity tied to a a chair. Everyone, what color is the chair? Answer the question out loud. The color of the chair is? Blue. Blue. So here's an interesting thing. There are times in life when we can find ourselves just like this beautiful animal. For all the potential that you have, for all the capacity of what God made you to be, you could be tethered to the blues, paralyzed by a script running inside of your inner life that says, you know you're stuck here. You know there's nothing you can do. You know it will always be this way. Now listen, if you can identify it all with this experience, and listen, Psalm 42 has some great news for you today. So as we get into Psalm 42, I hope you have your pen ready. There's just a lot of good stuff in Psalm 42 that you can write down. So here's what we're going to see as we go through Psalm 42 today. Here's our big idea. Experiencing sorrow is normal. In fact, let's just take a quick time out. 
When you think about sorrow, what sorrow might you be experiencing right now? There's some of you, the truth is, maybe you're feeling the weight or the burden of relationships in your life. Maybe a loved one's making decisions that's hurting them, so it's hurting you, or maybe a prodigal child, or maybe just a distance in your marriage. Where might you be experiencing sorrow in your relationships? Could be maybe in your financial life. Don't have enough money, or debt's piling up, or that you ended up with like a job change situation. It's not what you hoped. Maybe some of us, the sorrow we're experiencing is just a letdown, another letdown after another letdown. We're just so experiencing sorrow, it is normal, but sorrow controlling you is optional. And we're going to see how this plays out in Psalm 42 today. Now, help me out. True or false, nice and loud. Life has its ups and its downs. True or false? It's true. Life has both its ups. Sometimes you're high. That's great. I mean, life is high. Uh, and then sometimes, did you catch that? Some of you did. Some of you are like, what? I didn't catch it. Sometimes, you know, you're happy and you're up. Sometimes you're sad and you're down. And sometimes those two are one minute apart from each other. The reality is, in the complex world of human psychology, sometimes what goes up just always comes down in physics, but what goes down doesn't come up in our human psychology. Sometimes when we're down, we feel stuck down, and we just stay down. So listen, whatever may have gotten you down, however low you may feel right today, know this. God sees you. He knows where you are. And he wants to meet you in that low place. Now, I want to give a little clarification before we get too far into the message today. Here's the clarification. Experiencing deep sorrow is not the same as experiencing a medical condition like clinical depression or, or a mental health illness. Those are medical situations that require medical treatment. Let me just say this. I think it, it's just interesting that if you had a problem with your knee, if your knee wasn't working right, you would go get some medical treatment for your knee. If your stomach and digestion wasn't working right, you would go get some medical treatment for your digestion. But when your brain's not working right, what should you do? You can get medical treatment for your, in the same way that knees and intestines, brains are physiological and cannot function. And then you would need to get medical treatment. What we're talking about today is not that. What we're talking about today is the human experience of emotional heaviness, sorrow, even oppression, possibly even emotional darkness. Now, let's just be honest. All of us have been to that place. Now, let me just say this. If you, if you don't feel like you're in that kind of a place today, that's awesome. Let me just say this. You know someone who definitely is. Now, I did a bunch of looking at stats, and I was just like, let me just say this. All indicators of all measurements of sadness and hopelessness are on the rise rapidly in our culture with never before seen numbers. Suicides, sadness, hopelessness, every single age group up and to the right, record numbers all across. The, that's just the statistical reality. Oh. According to a recent Boston University School of Public Health study, one in three Americans experiences persistent feelings of sadness and hopelessness. So let me just say this. I want to offer you a guilt-relieving statement today. To be sorrowful isn't sinful. If you're in a sorrowful place, you're just really being pulled down by sorrow. At least it's not a sinful thing. And there are some people that feel like, because I'm in that place, maybe I'm just wrong. Maybe I'm bad. Maybe I'm being rejected by God. Maybe God just doesn't love me because of what I'm going through. Let me just offer you an encouraging word today. Many of the great characters of the Bible got depressed. In fact, I'm going to give you a quick list. Get your pen ready. I want you to write these down. I want you to look each of them up. Here's the first one. Moses. Moses, great character of the Bible, shows up in Hebrews 11, Hall of Faith. He got depressed. And wouldn't you if you were dragging 600,000 complaining Israelites across the <laughs> wilderness? So in Numbers chapter 11, here's what Moses says. Numbers 11, write it down, look it up. Numbers 11, verses 14 and 15. He looks to God and he says, if it's going to be like this, I don't want to live. Here's another great one. How about Elijah, the prophet? 
Incredible, powerful prophet of God coming off a great victory of 1 Kings 18, defeating the 450 prophets of Baal, this power encounter that he facilitated. It was like, I prayed and God made fire come from heaven. Pretty amazing. The very next chapter, he's isolated and alone. And so in 1 Kings 19, 4, he says to God, I am alone. Take me now. Here's another example. Jeremiah the prophet God gave him the difficult assignment of proclaiming God's word to a people whom God said ahead of time, they're going to ignore everything you say. And in Jeremiah 15, verse 10, Jeremiah says these words. He says, woe is me. I wish I were never born. It's not just Old Testament. Let's go New Testament. The Apostle Paul, write this down. The the great Apostle Paul admitted in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 8, that he despaired even of life itself. Then, of course, there's Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, who never disobeyed and never sinned. The night before he went to the cross to take our sins upon himself, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he gathered three of his closest friends, Peter, James, and John, and he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. So what are we saying? Here's what we're saying. Each of these characters not being rejected by God because they were in sorrowful places or even experiencing depression. Each of these characters, on the contrary, were being formed by God, were being shaped by God in those low places so that God could use them to do incredibly mighty things. And so Henry Nouwen, that great contemplative, wrote these words. I want you to see them. Here's what Nouwen said. He said, when we are crushed like grapes, we cannot think of the wine we will become. Listen, if you're experiencing sadness or heaviness or sorrow pulling down, listen, God is at work and he was trying to do something inside of you. You can't even imagine what you will become under his mighty hand. So what does that look like? That's what we'll see today in Psalm 42. Before we jump in, let's get a little background of Psalm 42. Psalm 42 and Psalm 43 were originally united as one psalm in some ancient manuscripts, and many Bibles treat them as one, but honestly, most of the Bibles separate the two because some manuscripts actually do. The older ones actually separate them. Psalm 42 is an individual lament psalm. It emphasizes trust in God during times of emotional distress. And so lament psalms, these are prayers of complaint to God as an act of faith. These are our prayers with raw emotions directed to God as acts of worship. Now just get your mind around that for a moment. Complaining to God and expressing raw emotions to God is an act of faith and worship. Yep, lament psalms. The most common type of psalm is a lament psalm. Of the 150 psalms, 60 of them are laments. In this psalm, the superscription simply reads, A Maskil of the Sons of Korah. The sons of Korah were the priests who were in charge with the ministry of singing and songs at the temple. And a maskil is a particular kind of a song. It's an instructive song, a song that gives you wisdom. So here in Psalm 42, we see a song that teaches us how to connect with God when we feel depressed. So as we go through Psalm, here's what we're going to notice. First of all, I want you to see. When you're feeling down, first thing you do, take stock of your emotions. First thing you do when you're feeling low and you're down, take stock of your emotions. We'll see that in the first four verses. Emotions. Some of you are like, oh, goody, we're going to talk about emotions and feelings at church today. <laughs> Listen, I, I, I get it. Uh, I feel you. Like, my non-feeler friends, I'm with you. I will say this, God has been teaching me over the years more and more That he made us to be made in the image of God means we weren't just made to have thoughts. We were also made to have emotions. And God's been dealing with me, growing me in that area. Now in 2018, Rose and I were involved in a very serious motorcycle accident. I was driving and she was in the back. We were coming out of South Lake Tahoe and the bike went out from under us and we woke up to 30 people in the street and two ambulances to take us away. And so processing both of us with broken bones and head injuries and all that comes from that was challenging. And I immediately recognized we need to do marriage counseling to have a third person help us sort out the things we're sorting out. So let me just take a time out and say this. If you ever find yourself in life and you feel like you're crazy and maybe you need some counseling, get some counseling. 
If you're in a marriage situation, it's just not get some marriage counseling. We've done it numerous times just to help sort things out. And this particular time, we were working through a lot of traumatic things. And one session, we were working through a particular issue, and our counselor slid in front of us two pieces of paper, and on each piece was a word cloud of 31 emotions. And because we were kind of bouncing off each other with this issue, she said, here's what I want you to do. Each of you circle all the emotions that you're experiencing right now. I circled two. (laughs) And trust me, I rounded up. (laughs) Because I actually experienced one emotion that was frustration that I was supposed to pick some emotions. (laughs) Rose circled 29. (laughs) And I said, no way are you experiencing 29 emotions right now. She said, oh, really? And she went one at a time and gave perfectly good explanations. It was then that I realized, it's almost like God was like, hey, Jim, you got a lot of work to do. <laughs> like loving me with all your heart and mind. You got the mind thing going. It's really great, but there's the heart part too. And you got a lot of room to grow in loving the Lord your God with your heart. And so it turns out, friends, the most unexplored part in the universe, it's the human heart. It's your heart. It's one of the most mysterious places in the world is your inner world. So where do you begin the exploration of learning how your inner world works? Well, Psalm 42, verses 1 and 2, really is a great place to begin. So Psalm 42 begins this way, verses 1 and 2. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go? And meet with God. Notice the imagery. It's a really vivid imagery. In fact, just picture a deer panting for water. That's a picture of your soul right now toward God. In the text, the word soul occurs there a couple of times. In Hebrew, the word soul typically refers to, it refers to the total being, the totality of who you are. And here's the psalmist saying, you know, when I look at the totality of who I am, deep inside me, there's this thing. <laughs> there's like a need, a drive for the living God. In other words, at our deepest level, every single one of us has a yearning. Every single one of us has a desire, a thirst in our soul that no material or earthly thing can ever satisfy. So if we're going to take stock of the emotions we see here in this psalm, the first emotion, you can write it down, here it is, emptiness. The psalmist is like, man, apart from God, like not worshiping God, not emptiness. So knowing our complex inner world really does begin by recognizing I have soul thirst, you have soul thirst. And recognizing that with that soul thirst that I have, no material thing, no earthly thing can ever satisfy it. Only the living God can. In fact, missionary theologian Leslie Newbegin, he put it best. Look what he said. Newbegin said, man is made for God, who is infinite. Therefore, man's desires are infinite. And no finite thing can ever satisfy them. Sit with that for a moment. Because more often than we really recognize, the root behind our sorrow is unfulfilled desire. Many of our lives are marked by dissatisfaction. We have this unfulfilled, deep soul thirst. And here's what we do. We, we want something, we long for something, so we go after it. We chase it, and then we get it. And when we get that thing that we chase before long, and you know this, we feel empty again. Every time. Then what? We chase another thing because that's what we long for. We think that's the answer. And then we get it. And then before long, we're empty again. And we do it again and again. And again, for some of you, that just describes your whole career path right there. The next thing, more money, greater title, corner on. And every time you get that thing, it turns empty on you and lets you down. For some of you, that just describes your relational process. If only I could be in a relationship with that person. Then you get that. And then after a long, you realize... Their breast stinks too, and then you're empty again, and now you gotta go find somebody. Until our soul drinks deeply and frequently of the presence of the living God, that inner drive, that inner soul thirst, it will drive us onward 
to more and more futility because the cycle doesn't go up, it goes down. And how do we end up in a low place? We keep chasing things that can't satisfy our soul thirst and before long, I'm in a low place. How did I get here? And so the psalmist response to this whole thing is interesting because he doesn't really respond in a good way. I want you to notice what he does. First of all, you know, notice this in verse 3. He's, he's feeding on his fears. You see that in verse 3? He's feeding on tears. Psalm 42, 3, he said, My tears have been my food day and night. Notice the word there, tears. Now, we don't know the exact circumstances going on with this psalmist. Or we have really no idea what they are, but we do know that he was overwhelmed with sadness and to the point of tears. Not just a couple tears, but tears. Day and night. Lots of tears. Dr. William Fry II of the Psychiatric Research Labs in St. Paul, he ranked the most common reasons for tears according to their research. Number one reason, sadness. Number two reason for tears, happiness. That's interesting. In fact, in their studies, they found that the chemical composition of tears of, tears of sadness is different from the chemical composition of tears of happiness. That sounds like a great sermon one day. We'll get after that some other day. <laughs> but what they found, so, so, so you've got tears of sadness, then happiness, anger, sympathy, anxiety, and fear. Some of you are like, that just describes my Monday morning. <laughs> right there. Sadness, happiness, anger, sympathy, anxiety, fear. Here's the, here's the truth, friends. The truth is this. To cry is to be human. So let me ask you, when was the last time you shed a tear? God never wastes a tear. Psalm 56, 8, David said, You, O Lord, you collect all my tears in your bottle. Jesus Christ understands your tears. Scripture refers to Jesus as the man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. In fact, shortest verse in the Bible is in John chapter 11, it's in verse 35. Two words, Jesus wept at the graveside of a loved one in the same way that maybe you have. Luke 19, verse 41 says that Jesus Christ wept over the city of Jerusalem because they rejected the, the true king who's come to provide them all that their souls long for. And he wept. Now what the psalmist does is really problematic because what he's doing is he feeds on his feelings. You notice he's just feeding on his tears. My tears are my food. Day and night, my tears are my food. Now here's the thing. We were created by God to have feelings, but we're not created by God for our feelings to have us. Truth is, I mean, honestly, we were all born into the world and the kind of same process happened. When you were born into the world, you were greeted by a smack on the butt, <laughs> followed by crying, loud noises, and tears. But for some of us, not a whole lot has changed since then. <laughs> we, were, we were meant to have feelings, but we're not meant for our feelings to have us, to control, to even own us. So the second emotion, if you're, if you're taking stock, the first one was emptiness, second one was sadness. So he's feeding on his tears, but notice he just gets a little worse. So he continues. Now he's listening to discouraging voices. Again, in verse 3, he continues. While they say to me all day long, where is your God? Here's a question. What's the they? Like, who's the they? Some English translations put the word people there. While people say to me, but in the original Hebrew, people's not there. Gr grammatically, the appropriate antecedent of the words, my tears. So it's interesting, in verse 3 and verse 10, the exact same structure in the original language happens. It's saying that my tears are saying something to me. And in verse 10, my adversary, my foes are saying something to me. And they're both saying the same thing. What's the message? The message is right here. Where is your God? Yikes. You talk about a tag team of discouragement, tears from within, foes from without, taunting where is your God? Hey, where's your God? Cry boy. Where's your God? Weepy lady. This is literally what's happening here. So the third emotion, if you're taking stock, is discouragement. The psalmist is feeling discouragement. And some of you, you know that battle so well. Battling discouraging voices from within and battling discouraging voices from without. 
And listen, anytime you're sorrowful, anytime you're in that battle, listen, let me say, write this down. Anytime you're battling discouraging voices that are saying, where is your God? Here's your answer. Psalm 115. Go ahead and write that down. Because the psalm is written to answer the question, where is your God? So anytime you've got that soundtrack of where is your God, you can just answer with Psalm 115 and then just go read it. Now, many years ago, I found myself at a very low point, as many of you know all about those experiences. And so I reached out to a friend who was a fellow pastor. I just want to sit and talk and just kind of process with him. And so I went to his office. When I walked in, I saw a plaque on the, on the wall. And I don't even remember what we talked about. I remember that plaque. And here's what the word said. A person's greatness is not measured by their talent or their wealth, but by what it takes to discourage them. Let me ask you, do you know what it takes to discourage you? Do you know that list? Your spiritual enemy does. Are you aware of these are the two, three things that could sink me if I were on my own? What does it take? So here's this psalmist. He's got, you know, emptiness, which goes to sadness, and then he's got discouragement. So what he ends up doing in verse 4, he starts rehearsing better days. So, so look at verse 4. He starts thinking about better days. He says, these things I remember, and I pour out my soul within me. For I used to go along with the throng and lead them in the procession to the house of God with the voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude-keeping festival. So notice those words there, remember and used to. The psalmist, though, in this low place, to start thinking about Better days. What were the better days? The better days were the days of gathered worship with God's people. You notice that? He's like, I'm thinking of better days. The days when life was joyful. When I would gather with God's people. You see the verbs are like, I would lead them in the throng. And we would go to the house of God. A multitude of people keeping festival together. So let me just say this. For those of you who, as a result of the pandemic, you've been worshiping online, I get it. That's a good thing for a while. But it won't take long at all. Your sadnesses and the experiences of life will start to pile up on you. And without the gathering of God's people to multiply those joys and help carry those sorrows, you'll be all on your own. So let me just say this. If you are still worshiping online, God bless you. Time has come to give back to the house of God, to gather on the people of God, to share their joys. Because you will find in sharing the joys of other people, your own burdens will be lifted in such a way that you can't do on your own. And so here's the psalmist experiencing all of these emotions that are just coming at him. So let's take stock. We saw emptiness, sadness, and discouragement. What do you do with that? Well, there really are only two options. You have despair and you have hope. Despair says your best days are behind you. Hope says your best days are ahead of you. And what the psalmist does next is incredible. He literally leads himself. No, he doesn't pick himself up off the ground. It's not, but he, he doesn't let life, life happen to him. He's not a passive bystander in life, but he recognizes I gotta do what I can do. I should do what I can do. And so he leads himself. And in, in doing what he can do, amazing things happen. So here's the second thing we're gonna notice here as we work through the psalm. When feeling down, make use of your faculties. Just make use of the God-given faculties that all of us have. We see that from verses five all the way to the end of the psalm. Now, let me see your hand if you ever heard that old saying. It takes more muscles to frown than to smile. You ever heard that before? Like, is that so? Is that a fact? Because if that's a fact, you know, you actually burn more calories by frowning. <laughs> and some of you, I can tell right now, you're getting a real good workout on today. <laughs> is it a fact that it takes more, like, you know, muscles to frown than to smile? Actually, it's not a fact. According to a Harvard Medical School, uh, Medical School report, they did a study on this, and they found minimally it takes six muscles to frown. Minimally. And minimally it takes ten muscles to smile. 
which means it takes more energy to smile, more effort to smile, more work to smile. And it makes perfect sense because you're working against gravity. And the next time you work against gravity, it just takes more energy. So let me just say this. Sadness has its own, emo- it's just like a, just emotional gravity. And to transcend that, it's going to take some energy. It's just going to take some energy. So the psalmist in verses 5 through 11 shows us how to use the God-given faculties that every one of us has to begin to rise above sinking sorrow. And so let me, I'm just going to say this. Before we look at these four last things real quick, before we look at these, I'm just going to say that these are kind of crazy. They are. They're kind of nutty. You're looking at them, that sounds crazy. They are crazy. Crazy enough to work. <laughs> so I want you to suspend judgment for a moment and just say, okay, try these. Try these. What the psalmist does, he does four things. First of all, talk to yourself. Talk to yourself. Psalm 42 in verse 5 and verse 11, because he actually repeats the same thing exactly twice, exact words. Psalm 42, verse 5. He says, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Here's a question. Who's the psalmist talking to? He's talking to himself. You say, that's kind of crazy to talk to yourself. Yeah, it is. Do it anyway. He's talking to himself. What is he saying? First of all, he says, he he just like calls out his emotions. He's like, why are you so sad? Why are you disturbed? So he calls out his emotions. You ever done that to yourself? I feel angry right now. That's a good thing to do. So he calls out his emotions. Then he actually commands his emotions. Hey, Put your hope in God. So he calls out his emotions, he commands them, and then he comforts himself with the truth. The truth that things won't always feel this way. I will yet praise him. So let me just say this. Whatever emotion you're going through right now, this emotion will pass. This season will pass. One of the best ways to get through it is talking to yourself. So let me ask you, have you ever preached to yourself? Have you ever done that? Have you ever talked to yourself? It's a phenomenal habit to get into. Just start telling yourself, label those emotions, tell them what to do, and then give yourself hope. In the scripture, it says that King David was a man after God's own heart. And so scholars spill a lot of ink to say, well, what does that mean? Why do, why do they say that about him? I think one of the clues is David did this a lot. I'll give you one example. You can write this down. At one point in David's leadership as the king early, all the people around revolted, and they rejected his leadership. They gathered together with stones, and they wanted to kill him. I think that's a low point. As a leader, I kind of feel like that might be a low one that I might have. <laughs> what does David do? First, write this down. Look it up. First Samuel 30, verse 6. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. He said, you know what? I'm going to do what I can do. Hey, self, let's trust God. Put our hope in God. Put our hope in God. How do you do that? Well, let's look at it this way. Here's our spiritual practice we can do this week. Let's give it a try. This is crazy. It's crazy enough to work. Let's give it a shot. Just set a reminder on your phone to just speak Psalm 42.5 aloud to yourself. Each day this week, set a reminder. If you don't have a reminder, okay, when you feel sad, pull it up and just do it. And I hope somebody hears you. Because listen, As a follower of Jesus, one of your main primary identities is a witness. Bear witness to yourself. Tell yourself the truth. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote a phenomenal book a long time ago. In fact, I'm going to recommend the book. It's called Spiritual Depression, Its Causes and Its Cures. It's a very robust book. Dr. Jones wrote these words. Have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? His soul, talking about the psalmist in Psalm 42, his soul had been depressing him, crushing him. So he stands up and he says, self, listen for a moment. I will speak to you. Here's the key, though. Not only must we preach to ourselves the truth, bear witness to ourselves, talk to ourselves. You have to do it. Here's the key. Repeatedly. One and done is not how this works. You know how I know? He does it twice in Psalm 42. And if you add Psalm 43, he does it three times in the exact same way. Psalm 42, verse 5. Psalm 42, verse 11. Psalm 43, verse 5. You got to do it again and again as needed. When you need a voice in your life, raise your own. 
first of all. So the second thing he does, he talks to himself. That's pretty nutty. Second of all, he thinks about God. So think about God. Why is that crazy? Well, here's why. He's obsessed with his sorrows. When you're obsessed with your sorrows, you're thinking about your sorrows. In the midst of his sorrows, he thinks about God. Notice verses 6 and 7. He said, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you. From the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar, deep calls to deep. In the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and your breakers have swept over me. Notice the word therefore. Therefore is a connector between two things, like cause and effect. Because he was downcast, my soul is downcast, therefore I will remember you. The verb remember in Hebrew means to call to mind. That's an intentional act of picking up the phone to call something to mind. It's like, I'm going to think about who? You. That's God. In the midst of his sorrow, he's thinking, he directs his mind intentionally to God. Now notice the geographical references. Did you notice there's a few of them? The land of Jordan, heights of Hermon, Mount Mazar. Where are these? These are all in northern Israel on the edge of the promised land. They're not in the promised land. They're up there on the edge in the periphery, far away from Jerusalem, far away from the temple where worship is centered, far away from the representation of God's presence at the temple. What's going on? The psalmist finds himself far on the outside looking in on the promises of God, far away from feeling God is close. And what does he do? He focuses his thoughts on God, even as waterfalls and waves and breakers of sadness, one after another, wash over him. Even in the midst of these waves, that's how sadness works, isn't it? Like waves. Even in the midst of the waves, he's thinking about God. And notice in verse 7, deep calls to deep. In the midst of your sorrow, a call is going out. Deep. God wants to do deep things in these deep places, making you a deep person with deep experiences of his deep love for you. So what do you do? Well, talk to yourself. Think about God. Third thing, sing to God. Sing to God. See, that's not crazy, sing to God. It is in the moment when you see what's going on here. Look, look at verse 8. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night... His song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. Do you notice a turning point, like a shift, an actual radical shift that just happened? Did you notice it? Did you catch it? It's in the fourth word of verse 8. By day, the Lord, the Lord. Up till this point in the psalm, the psalmist has been using the generic name for God, El or Elohim, just a just generic name for God about 13 times in the psalm. But here he uses a different name. The word Lord, Yahweh, which is really the covenant name of God. This is the name of God who's in relationship to those who commit themselves. It's the commitment name of God. This is the name of God whose promises can be trusted, whose presence is near all who seek him, who showers his loving kindness on his people even as they worship him from the place of sadness. So there's a turning point, but you notice the pivot of the turning point? It's right there in verse 8. He says, at night, his song is with me. At night. The most pivotal time to sing to God is not when the sun is shining. That's great. You can do that. should do that. But the most pivotal time is when life feels dark. When life feels dark, that's the most pivotal time to raise your voice and sing to God. You go, I don't know what to sing to God. I would say, make up your own song. Or use one of ours. Like, around here we sing a song like this one. How about this one? Faithful Now. And I will speak to my fear and preach to my doubt that you will be faithful then. You will be faithful now. Why not do that? You say, well, what will singing to God change? Well, it won't change the experience and make it just all go away. What it will do is it'll change how you go through the experience. You notice something here. Verses, in verse 3, he mentions day and night. So he's feeding on his tears day and night. Not good in verse 3. Over here in verse 8, day and night are different now. Do you notice that? Day and night is mentioned again. Instead of just feeding on his tears, now he's experiencing the reality of God's love at night and by day. What's changed? His experience of the presence of God. 
because he's calling to mind. He's talking to himself. He's thinking about God. He's singing to God, and things are really starting to become a different experience. And then the fourth thing, I want you to write this one down. Pray what you feel. That's the fourth thing the psalmist does here from a really sad place. Pray what you feel. Notice verses 9 and 10. The psalmist says, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by my enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying all day long, where is your God? Just those three words there, or those four words, I say to God. What's that called when you say something to God? That's prayer. What do I pray? Well, pray what the psalmist prays. In fact, here's some good advice about the psalms in general. Whenever you find a psalm that connects it where you are, do what the psalm does. Do what the psalmist does. Say, bow down, bow down. Say, shout out, shout out. And here, the psalmist expresses raw feelings to God in prayer. Did you catch those? Really raw. Why have you forgotten me? To God. That's pretty raw. I'm mourning. I feel oppressed. I'm in agony. I feel taunted. So the psalmist doesn't just take stock of his emotions. He does. He turns those emotions to prayer, and he prays them back to God in the rawest form. Now, the truth is we all go through these experiences, but we don't all do what the psalmist is doing. We don't take those emotions and turn them to prayers in the rawest form and give them back to God. The good news, friends, is that God not only welcomes this honesty, he can take it. And this is what the Psalms teaches us to do. To to speak to God in the rawest form from wherever we find ourselves. And when we come to the end of this Psalm, the problem is not fixed. How do we know? Well, look how the Psalm ends. Verse 11. Verse 11 says, Why, O my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. The psalm doesn't end with it fixed. The psalm ends with the psalmist continuing to take the path of hope. Many of you are familiar with the famous Bible teacher, Charles Stanley. Many years ago, Dr. Stanley found himself at a very low point, a lot of discouragement in his life. And an elderly lady in his church was reaching out to him inviting him to come over for lunch. And he didn't want to do it because he just imagined all she wanted to do is like complain about his leadership or all she wanted to do is offer her opinions on what he should be doing differently or whatever he was imagining. He just didn't want to go. And she persisted. So finally and reluctantly, he went. So after lunch, she escorted him to the next room. And on the wall in the room was this painting. It's the painting of Daniel in the lion's den from Daniel chapter 6. And she said, son, I brought you here because I want to show you this painting. So I want to ask you, what do you see? Tell me what you see. So Dr. Stanley looked at the painting and he was like, "Um, I don't know, um, seven lions. Uh, Their mouths are all closed. Daniel has his hands behind his back. I don't know. And she's like, is that all you notice? And he's like, yeah. Yeah. She said, son, what I brought you here to see is that Daniel's eyes are not on the lions. Daniel's eyes are not on the darkness around him. Daniel's eyes are not on the place where he's at. Daniel's eyes are on God. And that is what makes all the difference. Now, Daniel eventually got out, but only Jesus will get you through. Scripture calls Jesus a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And on the cross, Jesus Christ bore the source of all of our sorrow, and that is the sin that isolates us from the living God. And Scripture says in Revelation 21, verse 4, when the risen Christ returns... He will wipe away every tear. There will be no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. The former things have passed away. And Jesus said, behold, I make all things new. Write this down for the one who's speaking is faithful and true. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful that you created us in your image, not just to think not 
just to act, but even to feel. And today we've recognized that we do have a soul thirst, and it does drive us, and we make decisions, and sometimes it sets us on a path that takes us to let down and disappointment and dissatisfaction. Here we are today, from this spot where we are, we look up to you and say, God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, who entered into our sorrows in every way, who entered into our sin and took it upon himself and defeated it at the grave. And now the risen Christ gives us forgiveness and his spirit. And so right here, right now, we call upon you, Lord Jesus, and say, would you cleanse us of our sin? Would you forgive us? Would you be our savior? Would you meet us in this place, deep calling to deep? And would you do a deep work in us right here, right now, as we surrender to you, looking to you from this place where we are? Have your way. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thank you.